So my name is Brian Potter and I am the video content specialist here at Shippel. Um, I have been doing video production for close to 10 years now. Wow, that's kind of weird to realize, but that's the truth. And uh, I will be speaking at ShippleCon this year. It is October 6th and 7th. It's at the Norris Conference Center in uh, the city center right here in Houston, Texas. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the Reach panel, and I'm also going to be talking about flash mobs, but I will be doing a presentation with Brad Parler, who is on the phone call with me now. Um, Brad works at Tapeworks Texas. He is very knowledgeable when it comes to a lot of uh, video-related content and uh, online streaming, compression, things of that nature. Brad really knows what he's doing, uh, and he's a good friend of mine, so uh, we're going to be doing a presentation there. So also this evening, tonight, today, we are doing a party at St. Arnold's Brewery to kick off ShippleCon. It's from 6 to 8 p.m. We're going to have free beer, and that's pretty much all you need to know. Uh, but we're going to have free beer, free food. There's going to be giveaways. There's going to be all kinds of great stuff. <coughs> so it'll be um, our kickoff event for ShippleCon, and we hope you can join us. You can get more information by visiting uh, facebook.com forward slash shipple or visiting shipplecon.com. And you can pull up the event, and it's free. So please come and join us. So one of the first things that I get asked often when people talk about video production is, you know, what is it that I'm going to need? What is the, uh, what are the camera equipment? What's the lighting equipment? What kind of audio do I need? And it's a very large question, and it has a lot to do with what it is that you're going to shoot, um, how much money you have. Um, it has to do with a lot of factors. So I just want to cover some of the basics today. Um, so we'll start with one of the very basic things, which is, of course, um, well, the equipment you need is, uh, <laughs> you'll see a little bit of um, movie posters, and Erica, who's on the call with us, helped me grab some great photos for the uh, presentation. So there are a couple of basic um, components. Uh, there's a camera. There is your tripod, your lighting, and your audio. So I want to go through some of these uh, components with you. I've pulled up a website called uh, BH uh, Photo Video, and um, that is not it. Uh, b &H is an online supplier for um, audio, video, surveillance. I mean, they do an enormous amount of um, different kinds of sales. Um, so. I want to go through just, you know, some basic uh, cameras that you can look at. And like I said in the slide, it can range from anywhere from $80 to thousands of dollars. Uh, one of the things that um, you want to look at is brands. And I've selected um, a couple of key brands. I've selected Canon. I've selected uh, Panasonic and Sony. Um, there are, of course, a number. There's a Samsung. There's a JVC. Uh, there, there's a lot of good cameras out there, but um, these are some of the go-to, the sort of the standards. And you can see here that um, this is an HD camera. Um, uh, it's um, it records to uh, a couple of different memory cards. Um, it's 80 bucks, and um, you know that that's a pretty good little camera. Um, one of the things that you want to look at when you're looking at cameras. Are, there are two options for storage. There is internal, well there's three, but there's uh, internal hard drive, which means that it will record directly to a hard drive in the camera. And one of the things you want to look at when you are considering what kind of um, a hard drive driven camera to get is you want to look at how much storage does it have. Uh, is it a gig? Is it five gig? Is it a hundred gigs? The more space you have, the longer you can record. Um, I mean, some cameras have hundreds of gigs, and you can record hundreds of hours of footage. So, you know, that's uh, that's something important to keep in mind. Uh, another thing is, will your editing software import the footage you capture on your camera? We'll talk about editing software a little later, but things that you want to take a look at. And let's pull up this camera and see if it gives us information about um, the recording format. So we can see it records onto SD, SDHC, and XD, XC memory cards. These are just different kinds of memory cards. They record data in different kinds of ways. They have different pros and cons. Um, records 30p full HD video. Uh, let's see what else. Da, 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 da. MP4. Okay, so this is what you're looking at. This records an MP4 and iframe for convenience. MP4 is a very standard uh, codec for um, uh, video playback. Codecs are um, Think of it as a language. 
So if you have a book and that book has pictures and you know words and things like that, I can't read that book if it's in Japanese. But if I speak the language, I can understand what it's saying. Codecs work the same way. It it's all video content, but codecs just kind of help to compress and decompress the video that you record so that you can play it back or edit it. MP4 is a kind of a basic codec. It gets a little more complicated than that, but what you want to do is you want to see what format your recorder records in. And then from there, you're going to want to see if your editing software supports it. Chances are that 95% of the time, 99% of the time, your audio editing or your video editing software will handle it. So just wanted to show you for cameras, it goes anywhere from, you know, 80 bucks all the way through to some of these hard drive driven cameras at $700. Um, in fact, I just got, it was one of these Canon uh, cameras for uh, a church that I do video work for. And you can see here, it has a 16 gigabyte internal uh, drive for recording. It also has memory card slots, so you can expand the memory for longer, um, and then a number of different features. So uh, you can see that it goes up in price. Um, we're looking at $1,000 for this one. What does this do? Does this project? It has a built-in projector. That's pretty cool. So um, it goes all the way up the range. So that's something to keep in mind is that it there's a wide range of cameras. You want to look at, does it uh, record to an internal hard drive? Does it record to memory cards? And, uh, you know, how much do I want to get out of it? What are the features I'm really looking for? And things of that nature. So let's move on to the next part. So the next thing you want to look at is your tripod. Um, you can get a pretty basic tripod. And let me build some context for what we're talking about here. When it comes to video production, it's a lot like building a car. Uh, you have many options, and it has to do with what do you want to do with it? Do you want to go off-roading? Do you want a sports car? Do you want a minivan? Do you want functionality over speed and horsepower? So when it comes to video production, it's very similar. You want to think about what is it I'm trying to accomplish? What tools do I need to do that? Now everybody's at different skill levels, and you have to start somewhere, but uh, those are just kind of a framework to, to go into. There's no hard and fast rule with get this camera, get that microphone, get this lighting kit. It's a lot of different options. So when I say, you know, this is one way to go, that's kind of a context to keep it in. So let's take a look at some tripods. Tripods are essential for the work that you do on a regular basis. There is a big difference between a fluid head and a non-fluid head tripod. And um, uh, um, tripods can either be sticky or they can be nice and smooth. And what you don't want to have happen is when you're adjusting your shot or you're panning or something, it starts off with a, a bang or a, a jolt or something along those um, something along those lines. And, and Brad brings up a good point. Um, I like paints. We need we use them so that people will respect us when we are out in... Do you mean paints or pants? I don't know what I mean. But... Um, uh, uh, it's 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 critical to, to have a good tripod. So let's take a look at the different kinds. So there's a fluid head, which a fluid head means that the gears and components inside of the uh, tripod uh, head, which is a part of the tripod that you rotate around with, are using uh, some kind of internal like lubrication or um, something along those lines, rather than just locking it down with a, a turn or a knob uh, and just having some kind of bearings or something along those lines. So if you get a tripod, I highly recommend you pick something that has a fluid head um, because otherwise it will stick, it'll jam, it won't pan smoothly. Some brands that you can trust are um, Manfrotto. They make good tripods. Um, Satchler, but those are very expensive tripods. Smith Victor makes some okay tripods. Uh, Vinton, and uh, Vinton makes a little more professional grade tripods. Um, another thing you can do is you can buy tripods and kits. You can buy just the base with no head. You can buy the um, entire system. Uh, some tripods come with um, legs that have feet that are removable so that you can take these off and it will uh, be a little bit more steady on the ground if you want or you can replace with different kinds. Um, yes, Liebeck is a good brand too. So it's important. The key things you want to remember with your tripod system is you want to I have a feeling I'm going to have to do this a couple times, but that's okay, I'm glad on it. Uh, you're going to want to um, pick a tripod that is a fluid head and uh, use that one because it's, uh, it's very important. 
Um, second thing is lighting. Now, I say that lighting is fairly optional for a number of reasons. Um, people kind of get freaked out when it comes to lighting. Uh, and, you know, there's a good reason. You want to make sure that when you're lighting your shot that it looks good, um, that it's, there aren't crazy shadows under their eyes. You want your, your subject to be attractive. Uh, there are a number of options when it comes to lighting, and I want to show you some of the options so you can understand what you're looking at here. Um, there are, well, let me, let me go back a little bit. Um, there are on-camera lighting, so if you go out and you're doing a lot of um, production work in the field, you're going out and you're covering events a lot, or you are um, you know, going to fundraisers or conferences, uh, there are these really great kits that are on-camera LED lights. And they allow you to put it on the top of your camera, the little part where you put on a flash, and it can uh, adjust uh, the brightness without changing the, the color of the light coming out. Um, they can last for a long time. You can use batteries uh, on the camera, or you can have additional power supply options. Um, so there are a number of different um, options. These guys will require you to plug into power. I highly recommend the um, Anton Bauer or LED, um, what it, light panels. Um, they make very good uh, LED packages. That's a really good option for onboard lighting. Now you can get further down the line where you can actually pick up a full-on production kit that includes uh, multiple lights. Um, this is called a soft box. It allows you to put on the light so it's nice and soft to your subject. Um, it has individual um, uh, instruments that you can adjust. Uh, these are called barn doors. It allows you to adjust where the light goes in the room a little bit more. Um, I call these cookies, but they cut down the light coming out. So it comes with um, stands and everything else. Uh, you can see here that um, they are fairly expensive to pick up a lighting kit, but I'll tell you what, a lighting kit is a very important and very valuable um, component to your um, your entire kit because you're gonna if I always say if you have good uh, footage but no audio you have surveillance footage if you have um, great audio but um, terrible video you have a great CD or you've got like you know some good music to listen to so if you don't light well then you know people aren't gonna want to watch the work that you're doing so that's just a couple of things. That's I know I went from like the basic all the way up. So let me show you a little bit more uh, basic gear that you can get, um, and you know you can get creative. I've seen people uh, take uh, lighting kits from Home Depot that they use for construction sites and use those. Uh, you have these impact daylight uh, flood kits that you can set up. Just remember that you want to try to pick up some umbrellas that you see here or pick up some gel so you can diffuse the light a little bit so it's not so harsh and bright on your subject. Um, here's a good two light kit for under 500 bucks. Um, now you're going to get what you pay for. Keep that in mind. It's uh, very true in the video production um, industry um, that you get what you pay for. So keep that in mind with lighting. You can go pretty basic and pick up some basic kits or further down the line you can pick up some more uh, you know, expensive, and you know, find people who are doing the work and get your hands on it and see what you can do. Uh, and again, Brad makes a good point that uh, lighting does separate you from the rest of the crowd when it comes to people doing video production out there. Go see your work and go, wow, that looks really nice. So let's take a look at the next piece of information. So let's talk about what you do and what you don't want to do to create great video content. The first thing you want to do is you want to go for it. Uh, you can do it like this is in Happy Gilmore. You want to start shooting and you want to start editing. Just go out there, grab your camera, and shoot some stuff. Because what's going to happen is you're going to suck at first. You're not going to do that great, especially if you've never done anything like this before. Um, you're going to struggle with the footage that you get. You're going to, you know, you're going to say, oh, I wish I would have gotten that, would have gotten that. Whenever people ask me uh, about going into video production, I always tell them, here's what you want to do. Here's what's going to happen if you go into video production. You're going to shoot something, you're going to screw up, you're going to go back, you're going to fix it, you're going to shoot it again, you're going to work on a project you don't like, you're going to uh, work on a project you love and get a chance to do that, and then you're going to do that whole process over and over and over again. You're going to shoot and edit and make mistakes and learn. That's what happens when you, uh, you do your video production. You just have to go out there and you have to try. 
So don't let anything stop you. Just go and shoot something and keep doing that. Also what you want to do is you do want to plan. You want to make sure that before you jump into shooting something, uh, you want to think about, okay, so is this a shoot where, let's say you're doing a campaign about, um, you know, your company, and you want to, <laughs> you have a message over in the next three months, uh, every other week, you want to, you have some uh, document that you've put together that talks about, this is a new product we're rolling out, and these are some features you want to know about for your product. Well, that's not something you have to shoot at the beginning of each month. If you know what you want to do, you can show up, you can have your talent, you can be in the room, and you can shoot three months of video content in an afternoon or a period of two days. And so think about long-term purposes. Think about, is this something that I can shoot now and later I can edit it you know, over a period of a week and I have three months worth of video content that I can roll out, roll out over time? Uh, so, you know, take some time to plan what you want to do. Also research. One of the things that uh, I learned later on doing video production is I don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot of times people think they have to go out and they have to pick up an idea or try to formulate an idea in their head where there's somebody out there and they're doing it and they're doing it really well. So, you know, there is nothing new under the sun. Just go out and find what people are doing and see what you like and don't try to create it from scratch unless you absolutely have to. Um, there are people doing you know video production out there and they're doing it well so take the opportunity to learn what they're doing and see if you can do it better or different. Another thing that's so critically important it's so important to tell a story. You know anything that you shoot, anything that that you put together I like to think of it as you know, what is the story I'm trying to tell? Whether it's a product demonstration or it's talking about the new employees you just got hired at the company. And there are three essential parts to telling a story. I always think of it this way. Whenever I sit down to a project that's 30 seconds to 30 minutes, what's the beginning, middle, and end? You know, what is the, uh, what is the message behind this? How's it going to start? What are we going to tell in the middle and how are we going to wrap it up to, to convey the message? So think of those three things whenever you're putting something together. What is my story I'm telling? And what's the beginning and the middle and the end of what I'm trying to tell? Also, make sure you get your shots. Uh, you need to get an establishing shot. And we'll go over some of these shots here and uh, with the different kind of uh, shots that you can take in a minute. But you want to get an establishing shot. Show the whole crowd. If there are 300 people there and all you do is shoot the speaker, we'll never know that they're speaking to a room of three or 400 people and make it look like they're speaking in front of five or six people for all we know. Uh, you want to get cutaways, and again, we'll we'll go back to all of this. You want to get your B-roll. That's the role. That's the footage that you're going to use. Like if somebody's speaking and says, "My favorite thing about this conference was all the food that everybody brought," and then it's going to fade into all the food as they continue to speak. It was delicious, and it was you know well prepared, and they're going to. That's B-roll. Anything that goes on top of your main message or somebody speaking about something. And like the picture shows, I call this tools in the toolbox. If you're out and you're shooting. Shoot, 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 and keep shooting. Because I think of it as putting tools in the toolbox. When I go back into the editing room, I don't want to sit there and go, you know, they talked about that one speaker and how he greeted everybody at the end, and I don't have any footage of that. So get that stuff in there, and guess what? Worst case scenario, you don't use it, and that's perfectly fine. Here are some things that you may want to try to avoid. Uh, you don't want to make a video that's longer than the site you are uploading to can allow. And what I mean by that is, if you know that you're going to put some video on YouTube, let's say you're doing a series of tutorials and you're going to have it totally YouTube focused, you want to find out what the time limit is for YouTube. We'll talk about that in a minute. So think about, you know, I'm shooting this and I need to make it X amount of time and I can't make it any longer than that. So be very careful about making it just the right amount of time for the site that you're uploading it to. You don't want to make a really long video, and if you have to think, what's going on with the internet nowadays is, and this number I put in here is maybe a little even longer than it should be, but people's attention spans are very long, uh, very short, excuse me. So you want to think, is my video longer than two and a half or three minutes? And if it is, then maybe I can split this up into a couple of videos. Now again, like I said in the beginning, uh, you have to think about this as a matter of content and what it is that you're building. If you're doing a video that's about our company and it needs to be three and a half minutes long because you've been around for 30 years and it's a major campaign, it's something you're really driving, then that's something that 
the content will dictate the length of the video that you're working on. So keep that in mind. But as a general rule, if you're going to a general audience and you're doing sort of videos that help promote an event or something along those lines, if you're looking at something that's over a minute and 45 seconds, two and a half minutes, you're starting to push the limit as to what they're listening to or looking at. Now, if it's really compelling and very dynamic and interesting, and I'll show you an example of, of something like that, then a lot of times you will show somebody a video that's four minutes long and they'll say, I wasn't even aware that I was watching a video, video that's you know that long. And so that can work out in your favor sometimes, but as a general rule, you want to keep that in mind. Another thing you definitely don't want to do, and this happens all the time, don't think that it won't take very long to shoot, edit, uh, produce your content. Uh, one of the things that you hear a lot, or I hear a lot, is, well, we just want a quick three-minute video. And anybody who does video production out there right now, if you walk into their, you know, their offices or sit down to talk to them about it, and you say, I just want a three-minute video, in the back of their head, they're saying to themselves, this person has no idea what they're talking about, and it's going to take way longer to do something like that. So if you think you're just going to show up and sit down with somebody and do an interview with them or have them read from a script, plan a lot more time than you think it's going to. There is a principle called the time quality money principle. And let's see, actually, I didn't have this pull up. Let's see if I can pull it up real quick. Also known as a project triangle. And this is a concept. You have, or in other words, good, cheap, and fast. So time, quality, and money. And the thing is, you get to pick two. Do you want it good and cheap? Well, it's not going to go very fast. Do you want it good and fast is going to cost you a lot of money. If you want it fast and cheap, guess what? It's not going to be very good. So keep in mind that if you're wanting to shoot something and it's going to take, you know, a bit of time, you have to think, do I want it to be good? Do I want it to be cheap? And in this, in some ways, this word cheap translates to another version of your own time. If you're doing it for a company, this translates into hours or, you know, how much time you're going to spend on a project. So keep in mind, good, fast, and cheap and you get to pick two of them. It's a good principle to live by. Get back here. A good rule of thumb that I like to go by is that for every finished minute of video, there's about three to, four, three to five hours worth of work behind it. And that, in my experience, has pretty much been the average. And what that includes is pre-production, writing, getting your talent, finding a location, setting up, actually shooting, tearing down, moving to different locations, bringing the footage into your editor, uh, editing, going through reviews, color correction, motion graphics, audio. Now, I'm not trying to overwhelm you, but I'm just letting you know that it's not a matter of show up, shoot, edit, deliver. Now, that will happen if you've done it for a long time. Like, a, I've shot video for over 10 years, and I can show up to a location, depending on the content, I can probably shoot edit and deliver in the same day if I have to, but it's because I've done this for a long time and so I'm able to get things out quickly. But as you're learning and growing, keep in mind that it takes a decent amount of time for every finished minute of video that you're working on. So at this time I'm going to open up the phones and I want to open up to uh, questions. So does anybody have any quick questions for the pieces we just covered? Go ahead. That's a good question. Uh, we're going to cover that in just a minute. We're going to go over editing software. I even have a piece of software open right now that I'm going to give you a basic overview of what's involved with doing editing work. But um, I'm, I'm going to get to that a little bit later on. There's a couple of tools I'm going to share with you that will help you get that done. Anybody else? Anything you want to type in or ask any questions? Okay, very good. Here we go. So let's move on. You are all muted now. I'm so sorry. Let's talk about some basic shots. There are some standard shots that you will get on a regular basis. Um, there's a wide shot, a medium shot, close up, an over the shoulder, and a two shot. And I actually have those pulled up, which is why I just ran through them. 
So this is a website called MediaCollege.com. They've got a lot of really um, great content that's uh, very basic, very easy to understand, and uh, a lot of it's free. So let's talk about some of the shots here. Let me zoom in a little bit. Everybody see? Oh, look, it automatically adjusts. That's very cool. Everybody see that? All right. Okay. So, like we talked about, you know, he's what we're breaking this down into is a going from wide to bringing it all the way in. So we have an extreme wide shot which shows everything. It's the Ben Hur, you know, it's the the army charging across the field. And then there's BWS with a very wide shot, uh, a wide shot, and if we're talking about a subject, you know, a person, a wide shot's uh, head to toe and a little bit more extra room. A medium shot is usually above the knees, just about the waist up, as you can see here. A medium close-up is starting just below the chest and, you know, up to the head. A close-up is bringing it into about, like you see here, neck level. ECU refers to, like, a, think of it as a Clint Eastwood kind of a thing. Uh, the eyes, the mouth, um, somebody grabbing something, extreme close-ups are ECUs. Cut-ins are when somebody's talking and you cut this an action that they're doing. So if they're speaking and you cut to their hands, or like we were talking about earlier, B-roll, uh, and they're talking, that's a cut-in. Uh, a cutaway is when somebody's speaking and you show something other than the person that is speaking, uh, also known as some more B-roll. Two-shot, and a, a thing I want to point out before I keep moving through this is um, something called headroom uh, and rule of thirds, and this is a perfect example of it. <laughs> Rule of thirds takes this idea that you want to take a shot and you want to break it into like if you can imagine a line here and a line sort of here and a line kind of here and a line kind of here and if you can imagine a grid more or less on this in fact let's just do this. That's a good example. Rule of thirds breaks your frame up into three horizontal and three vertical planes and basically what you want to do is imagine what the general rule of thumb is that you place your subject at a corner where they intersect so in this case you can see this B is in the top right third or there's the top left bottom left bottom right so by placing a subject in or at these connecting points it creates an image that's pleasing to the eye which you can kind of see here now that you understand where the rule of thirds are you can see he's in the top right third a bit and your eye kind of draws up there and they continued the shot and the rule of thirds through this. Um, you'll notice that, like, this is kind of a third, where it's right at the eyeball. And you can shoot in different ways. Some people choose to do a close-up where they cut off the forehead a little bit, and they do the third more along this area. Um, if he was facing, you'll also notice he's kind of leaning and facing to the right a little bit. So it gives him a little bit of, uh, yeah, golden ratio. That's actually a really interesting thing to pull up, the Fibonacci whatever it's called. Uh, golden ratio is very, very interesting. Um, it's a, well, let's not pull up the, uh, <laughs> that idea, let's pull up from Wikipedia. Golden ratio is very interesting. It takes the idea behind mathematical sort of beauty, and it takes, let's see if I can find it with a photo. So, here's what's called, sorry for the tongue thing, that's a little weird, but uh, <laughs> here's the golden ratio. So you saw before, and it creates this kind of, this is actually a mathematical equation, and it, it's used very often in uh, photography and video, and once you understand it, you will start to see it everywhere. Um, I'm going to pull this up because, I don't know, I'm going to put a disclaimer, I'm not exactly sure what's on this. So, um, you'll see it. Uh, laid out this way, facing the other direction, facing this direction. And now that you see it, you can see how when you see a lot of photography that you like, you're like, I don't know why, but that looks really nice. It's because many times it's applying this golden ratio, um, or the divine proportion, which I think is such a cool name for it. So that's something to keep in mind as a rule of third. So let's keep going through the, the shots here. So there's a two shot. You see they're framed nicely, their head isn't cut off, there's a little bit of extra room on either side of them, so they're nice in the middle of the frame. Over the shoulder, this is something that you'll use when you're interviewing somebody. Uh, so you can see here, if you apply the golden ratio kind of thing, it's right along here. A rule of thirds is also in play. He's in the right side of the frame, they're cutting off his head a little bit, 
but they're also allowing a little bit of room for the head and the side of the frame so they're not crowded. Uh, knotty shot is something they use for, um, like it's saying here, they use it for a reference for uh, news and things of that nature where they turn and they show the person looking uh, at the other person and nodding. Point of view would be as if they're looking from the person's eyes and I don't know why they use a name for weather shot, I've never heard that. So these are some general rules of thumb for photography or videography is a wide shot. You want to, I always say you want to start wide and move in. So if you're shooting an event, you want to go and shoot everybody in the room and they get a little closer, then a little closer, a little closer, a little closer, then move your shot and get something else. Start wide and move in, 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 in. So you may start at the thing and end up on a place setting describing what the event is. So start wide and move in on your subject. That's a general rule of thumb that I like to go by. Okay. So let's keep going. So let's talk about some tips for shooting. What you want to do a lot of times is when you're out and about, you don't have any other options to change your lighting or anything like that. You want to shoot with the sun behind your camera operator facing your subject. And the reason I say this is there are many times where a majority of people will be shooting with cameras that allow very little to no manual control over what you're shooting. And what this results in is if you have a bright light behind your subject, it'll make your subject dark and silhouetted. Uh, some cameras now have a touch screen where you can touch a person's face and will kind of gain exposure from that. But as a general rule of thumb, they will not have that option. And so you want to have uh, the sun behind you facing them. What that can do sometimes is they get real squinty. So get creative. But what the general principle is, is you don't want the sun or a bright light behind your subject. You want your subject brighter than what's around them if possible. What you can do to accomplish that is you can place the subject in the shade and that allows for a nice even light on your subject because there's no harsh light coming at them. It's nice and even and it will you know, bump up the exposure for you and that creates you know, some general uh, uh, safety precautions for, for doing that. So um, Marlene asked earlier about some basic video editing tools. And before I get onto this, uh, I want to unmute it for a second. And does anybody have any questions about the kinds of shots or some of those tips that we talked about for doing some uh, shooting while you're out and about? Okay, very good. So let's talk about basic video editing. I'm sure a lot of you came to hear about this. I'm going to start with this YouTube editor. It's kind of a weird place to start, but um, YouTube editor has some really basic functions. Um, uh, I'm going to show you these in a minute for editing. It allows you to use um, videos you can upload to YouTube and then you can combine them and edit them down within the editor. You don't have to have any software installed on your computer. You don't have to buy anything. It's free. Um, it is limited to the videos uh, that you upload that you upload, or anything that's a Creative Commons video that you can search and I'll show you that. Um, it has some uh, built-in uh, video effects, but there's a fun fact here in that it has a 3D video creator, which is just something I found that was kind of interesting. So if you have a camera that can record video in 3D, you can do a 3D video. So let's take a look at the YouTube video editor. I have uh, my account pulled up here, and the cool thing is that I've uploaded these videos, and what I can do is I can choose to grab one of the videos, and I can drag it in here and let's say I wanted to have that go into another video that I recorded about adopting a cat and a dog. Well just by dragging these in they are now in my timeline and I could add audio here if I were to upload some audio or if I were to search for some audio. So let's listen to this here. Nope, okay, these are not working. But it allows you to search uh, some, uh, some Creative Commons music. So once you're in here, uh, you can do some cool stuff. You can click on uh, Trim. This is a video. Where is it? Where is it? Where is that hot dog? Did you find it? Get it. Get it is let's say you didn't want that first part, you want to get just to the part where Fred 
finds the food just before. And he's got it there. And he got it there. So about 45 seconds or so, it brings it in. So let's trim over to 45 seconds. Or so. And click save. And now this has been trimmed down to 10 seconds. And we can even go back. So that's kind of a cool thing that this does. Um, another thing is you can rotate it. This is there are some pretty decent uh, stabilization built in here. So if you watch this with a stabilizer enabled for a second, it'll take a second for it to pull up. Hey, <laughs> you get it? Aside, you can see the difference with the stabilizer, and this is very important with the. So it's got a built-in stabilizer. And let's say you've got your videos here and you want to do a crossfade. You could click and drag a crossfade in between the two. And your final video will show up here. Uh, no, it won't. <laughs> because YouTube wanted to throw me an error. So that is very close. Oh, OK. So you can throw in some effects. Um, you can change the duration. Uh, quick note, by the way, crossfade, please only use this. Don't do crossfader or wipe, and for the love of everything that's holy in video, don't do checkerboard or vertical blinds or hearts. Just please stay away from that. Uh, it will not make you look professional. So, uh, but you can add videos and content and search for, you know, if I wanted a plane, I could find something in here that maybe has something with a plane in it. Uh, a plane crash, that might be nice, and you can drag that in here. So the YouTube video, editor, that's kind of cool and kind of interesting. Let's talk about some other things. So we have the YouTube video editor. Oh, that's weird. ShippleCon thing. Oh, that's... I didn't know how that showed up. By the way, ShippleCon is this month. Uh, ShippleCon.com. Check it out. Okay, so let's take a look at some consumer software. Some software that's available um, that's fairly inexpensive and that is easy to use. One of the first ones is um, iMovie. And a lot of people are familiar with iMovie. Um, a lot of people have heard of it. Uh, it's, um, it's very inexpensive, and a lot of times it's built into your Mac. Cool thing here, did you know that your iPhone, the latest version of your iPhone, and many smartphones now will shoot HD video? And Apple actually released an iMovie app that you can edit videos in, and it's actually kind of pretty decent to be able to use on the fly. You should check that out, it's very interesting. I'm an Adobe guy, I'm going to say that right off the bat, that I use Adobe Premiere for 99% of my video career, I've used Adobe Premiere. I highly recommend it. It's very strong. Um, it integrates with all the other Adobe products, Photoshop, uh, After Effects, Illustrator. Um, and I'll show you something really cool later on about that. But they have a version of Adobe called Premiere Elements. I should have kept this in its own window. So be. Um, Adobe Premiere Elements allows you to uh, do some basic uh, video editing. Uh, it is inexpensive and uh, I believe, where is it? How much is it? Brad may know how much Premiere Elements is, but um, it allows you to import, it uh, allows you to uh, tag, and allows you to export quickly. Uh, it's a very good consumer uh, piece of software. Here is iMovie. Um, and iMovie has a lot of great features too. Uh, it allows you to bring in music from iTunes. It allows you to um, create some cool titles. Uh, I mean, it allows you to do a lot of really cool built-in effects. Uh, it's a pretty cool piece of software, and it's very familiar with a lot of people. Windows Movie Maker. I have not used Windows Movie Maker in a long time, uh, but I hope that they have improved it uh, since the last time I used it. Uh, I'm sure it's very similar to a lot of the consumer ones you find out there existing. Uh, Brad says that Premiere Elements is 100 bucks. That is a good, good amount of money for doing video work you do on a regular basis, and you want to do simple stuff. Um, so, uh, Windows Movie Maker is another option for um, your consumer software. So, let's put this up here. Stop getting a preview, huh? And Gretchen says that Movie Maker works pretty well, actually. 
So let's talk about professional software. If you guys have not seen the professional, by the way, with um, I can the actors. Oh, man. that's a great movie. Adobe Premiere, like I was talking about earlier. Adobe Premiere is a great piece of software. Um, it doesn't require any special hardware to run. It can install on your computer um, very easily. With any other software, you want to check your system specs, but I highly recommend Adobe Premiere uh, Final Cut Pro. Now, Final Cut Pro is gone. Final Cut Pro X, or Final Cut X, or whatever they're calling it now, is alive and stumbling along, in my opinion. Um, they just recently released an update for Final Cut that allows you to export XML and do things that are pretty standard. And I hope that Apple will realize how important it is to continue to update the software because um, it made a lot of people in the video world um, unhappy. So Final Cut Pro X is currently what's out there. Final Cut Pro X is like iMovie on steroids. Um, and I know that's very simplistic and I'm probably oversimplifying, but it's a more professional version of iMovie, I guess you could say. Uh, Sony Vegas, which Brad just mentioned. Um, it's 50 bucks. Uh, it is a full-featured piece of software. Uh, it does a lot of the work that you need to do. Um, now here's what you need to keep in mind, that when you have this different software installed, your mileage may vary depending on your computer hardware. Um, so what you want to do is go to you know the system specs version of the website and find out what you need for minimum requirements. Um, and uh, generally, uh, most current hardware, if you get an iMac, an iMac nowadays, like if you get a new iMac, those things are, are that's a workstation. It will do really good work. Now this computer that I've built has um, eight cores of RAM, uh, excuse me, eight cores of RAM. It has uh, eight processors, it has uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM, it has a you know a specific video card that's for Adobe, so it's a very powerful system. Uh, so you can customize and you can build systems that are very powerful if you'd like. Um, so let's take a look at some of the other software that you may also include with your video editing package. Um, After Effects, which comes with the um, production premium bundle and the master's collection, of course, with Adobe. Um, it is a motion graphics piece of software. Uh, Final Cut comes with motion, that's the name of it. Uh, there's also Encore and things of that nature. Sorensen Squeeze, um, this is not the editing side, this is the compression side. Sorensen Squeeze is software that you bring your video into and you compress it using presets and you can upload it or burn a DVD. There's also a Telestream episode, um, which is more expensive. It's, these are very powerful, full-featured pieces of software. Um, so keep that in mind. So uh, at this point, I'm going to unmute it, and then we're going to take a look at Adobe Premiere for a minute so you can get an idea of what happens once you actually jump into one of these pieces of software. So do we have any questions about what I just covered? Go right ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Yes, uh, this presentation will be available and I will email you a link when I'm done. This exact presentation you're looking at <clears throat> will uh, will be up there. So um, I can go back. In fact, let me go back real quick. And if you want to take a minute and either grab a screenshot or write that down real quick. Um, Premiere, Final Cut, Vegas. Those are some of the uh, pro software. And then some of the consumer software is uh, iMovie, uh, Adobe Premiere Elements, and uh, Windows Movie Maker. Yeah, Avid. I, I didn't talk about Avid because I, uh, that in my opinion, the Avid route is a, a completely different webinar. That's, that's a little more intense. Uh, that's a little more, um, <clears throat> there, I know there's different flavors of it. It's just too complicated for me to get into right now. There's, there's you know, uh, Media Composer, and uh, anyway, it, it's, a, it's a good piece of software. And let me say this real quick, too, because people always say this. They always say, what did you edit that on? What software do you use? And here is my stance on that. If you go and you see a movie, you go see um, The Lord of the Rings, you don't sit in the movie theater and say, wow, they must have cut that on Avid, or I bet they cut that movie with Final Cut. You, you don't think about that. Um, you think, I love that story, 
I was captivated by um, what it was, you know, the, the, the emotion of it. It, it, like Brad said, it, it doesn't matter. I use Adobe because I've used it for so long that I'm very fast using Adobe. If you sit, if you sit me down in front of Final Cut or Avid, it'll take me 10 times longer to do what I know how to do right now in Adobe. Same thing with the Final Cut editor. We can be at the same skill level, uh, have the same experience, but if you put us in front of a different piece of software, they're not going to know what to do initially. They're going to need to have their hand held or walk through some commands because fundamentally, your editing software is pretty much all the same. What changes is how it works with the footage, how you export things, how you import things, but the functions and what it does are fundamentally the same. So don't get caught up on what kind of editing software you should use. But I do recommend that you look at what's out there, the features it has, the features you want, and then pick one and become very proficient with it. And that will go further than spending more money on something just because it has more features you may never use. Find something that fits your needs and get really good at it and move forward from there. But if somebody says, well, you know, you have to cut on Final Cut if you're going to be a professional, or you have to cut on Adobe if you want to be a professional, that's not true. Uh, you have to be a professional and use the software that you like. That's what makes the difference. Are there any other questions uh, before we move on? Yes, uh, in this next section we are going to talk about YouTube and Vimeo and Facebook and all that good stuff. So uh, we are getting there. We are getting there. Anybody else? Okay, here we go. Okay, so let's talk about optimizing video for and uploading it online. Optimus Prime. Anybody? Okay. So we're going to get a little technical for a minute. I'll show you some uh, screenshots of what I'm talking about. The, um, there are uh, different ways to optimize for different things. There are a couple of key factors that you want to keep in mind. You want to maintain the original frame rate, frame rate and aspect ratio. What do I mean by that? Let me pull up a video for you. So here's a video that we did. It's really huge. Let me turn this down a bit. For our uh, Chippel new guys that I shot here at Chippel. And you'll see up here some information. <coughs> we see uh, the current size. We see the frame rate. FPS is frames per second. Um, it was originally 1920 by 1080, which is high definition. And you'll see, um, let me make this a little smaller so it's on a little lighter background, that it looks like it's sort of a um, rectangle rather than a square. Whereas here, on the video of me, you see it's like a a square. This is a rectangle. This is what's referred to as um, aspect ratio. And I don't want to get into it too much, but if you're going to write something down, write down aspect ratio, jump onto Google, start to do a little bit of research. Basically, what happens is when you shoot your video, there are two different formats uh, or two different aspect ratios fundamentally that for most cameras you will be shooting in. One is 4 by 3 which is what you're looking at now. And if you think of it as what it's talking about, it's four pixels by three pixels. And it sort of realigns that a little bit when you're on your television, and it makes it more or less box. So four by four would be perfectly square. So it's a little less than perfectly square. And then there's 16 by nine, which is generally referred to as widescreen. When you go see a movie, 99% of the time it's going to be in widescreen or 16 by nine. That's what's referred to as the aspect ratio. So the reason that's important is when you go to export your video from whatever software you choose, and I'll show you that in Premiere in a minute, it gives you different options. It'll say widescreen, it'll say standard, it'll say 4x3 or 16x9. So know what your original video was shot in and try to maintain the current aspect ratio when you export it. Because video sites nowadays will recognize that and it will either add bars if it needs to or it'll make it wide or make it 4x3 and it will maintain the aspect ratio when uploading. But what happens is if you have a video that was originally widescreen and you export it as 4x3, it adds black bars on the top and the bottom and it makes it wide across. So you want to keep the original aspect ratio if you want to, so you have nice full res, full frame video. YouTube is up. It's YouTube up. So, yeah, let's get back to that. We're getting there, we're getting there. So, 
So different online hosts prefer different kinds of formats. Uh, YouTube likes 30 frames a second at 48K, which is the audio constant bit rate. And I'll show you again. I just want you to get this information top of your head, and it's easier to show you. But um, YouTube likes 30 frames a second. Um, now, you can upload in um, 24 frames a second, uh, 2997, or you know those kinds of things. What it usually does is it will conform it. And um, video can be shot in a number of different ways. It can be shot at 24 frames a second. Any movie you go see in a movie theater is 24 frames a second. Um, a lot of these uh, cameras that I showed you earlier that are the less expensive ones, um, like you saw that one that said 30p. What the 30p stands for is 30 frames a second progressive. And you're going to have to look into it interlaced and progressive. But again, this is online basics, so we're just going to cover the basics. So let me get a little bit into that. Um, and you can use Soars and Squeeze to uh, um, tell the stream episode, and they have uh, presets to do that. So let me go into Premiere real quick, and I want to show you for exporting your video. So here we have a timeline of that video that I showed you for um, the Shipple New Guys. Erica drew all of these by hand. I just want to say that she did an amazing job. So in Premiere, the way that you export video is uh, there's a export media command. And what we have, and let me just go to H264, so it's a little shorter list, is um, a number of settings. Now this may be very overwhelming. Ignore everything over here, and we'll just go down the line here. Uh, everybody see this okay? Do I need to zoom in? It's going to let me zoom in. There we go. So, uh, let's see. So here we have the format, which is H.264. And again, that's a codec. It's a QuickTime codec. It's a very good codec. It records uh, video very well. Um, it maintains excellent quality while lowering the file size significantly. There are a number, uh, FLV is Flash, um, MPEG-2 is DVD, uh, QuickTime just exports to any QuickTime format you like, but for general web stuff, you can do H.264. You'll see in here, uh, under preset, there are a number of presets. You can go to iPhone, you can go to iPads, you can go to Apple TV, uh, HD TV. Uh, you can go, and the ones you want to look at here are YouTube. So you'll see there's a YouTube SD, which stands for Standard Definition. YouTube widescreen HD and YouTube widescreen SD. So let's just click on well, YouTube widescreen HD and see what it does. So initially it doesn't look like it did much of anything. But what it's done is it's told us that it's NTSC, which is the North American Television Standard. Um, the frame width is 1280 and the frame height is 720. That is the dimensions of the video. Now our original video is uh, 1920 by 1080, but we can change that later if we want to. Uh, the frame rate, 24 frames a second. And again, YouTube says they like, um, yeah, uh, YouTube said they like 20, uh, 30 frames. But if you select, general rule of thumb I like to go by is you can see here that under source, it says that the original source was 23.976 or 24 frames a second. I like to keep the frame rate uh, the same as the original video when exporting for the web. It's not going to hurt anything. And um, it, uh, it just is rather than because what will happen a lot of times is it will it'll look a little funny or the audio may drift you don't want any of that um, progressive is what you want to select for the web when it records video um, back in the day before LCD TVs um, the television worked by scanning a line a series of lines and then scanning like an even series and then scanning an odd series and that's how it would show the video very fast 60 times a second so there is an upper field and a lower field well, a lot of times now, with that camera we saw earlier where it said 30p, that's what progressive means. Progressive doesn't record um, in... Oh, hello, I'm gigantic. Uh, progressive doesn't record any individual frames. It records, like when you shoot with a film camera, which I'm going to have to explain this in a different way in the future, I guess. But um, like a digital camera, when you take a picture on your DSLR or your point-and-shoot, it gives you a JPEG. That's one picture, not a series of pictures you have to put together. Same thing is what happens when you shoot progressive. It shoots one frame, and then another frame, and another frame, rather than interlace, where it shoots part of one, part of another, and then the computer puts them together. So all you need to know for online video is you want to shoot progressive, and you want to export progressive. Moving on. Uh, the aspect ratio. This is the thing we talked about. Now, the original aspect ratio of this was square. 
which uh, you can see by looking at it is already widescreen. HD video, 1920 by 1080, the aspect ratio is widescreen. But if it was something else, like it was, uh, now we're exporting for the web, so we want to export to square pixels. But if you were exporting for something like a DVD, you need to tell it, okay, this, this video is widescreen, and then it will go ahead and adjust it for your television. Before I go any further, let me go to my notes and see if I'm talking about bitrate. Not yet. Okay. That's in this section. So what we have is, again, we have the width and height. We have the frame rate. We have the aspect ratio. This is the next important thing. You see this saying down here where it says estimated file size? I'm going to change this to CBR. That just for simplicity. That stands for constant bitrate. The bitrate, think of it this way. This is what sets the file size and the quality of your video. Bitrate, when you shoot a video on your handheld video camera, it records pretty much as much as it can uncompressed or original footage. And what that looks like is it'll record at 5 megabytes a second or 10 megabytes a second. What the megabytes a second is important is because that, think of it as the density of how much you're recording. The higher the megabytes a second, the more information it can pack into a single second of time. So if we have an HD video camera and shooting this big image with lots of information, if it has a high bit rate, it's going to record a lot of information at one time. If it has a lower bit rate, it's going to only record partially, uh, the partial information. It's not going to miss frames or anything like that. It's going to have to compress it. So the bit rate refers to how much information per second is going to go into the video that you're compressing. So if you have a three minute video and it's a megabyte a second, it's going to make it X big. If you need it to be smaller, you have to lower the amount of uh, the, the bit rate, but that's going to result in a uh, lower quality video. So let's take a look at how you can set the bit rate, at least in Premiere. And again, with your software, it's all different. Uh, Final Cut uses compressors, Sorensen is its own gigantic piece of software that deals with all these things, but it's going to use similar ver verbiage. It's going to use bit rate. It's going to use audio bit rate. It's going to use frames per second and field order, things like that. So what you need to think about is what is the file size that I need it to be? And we can talk about in a minute. Uh, I have uh, some information about file size limitations. But um, let's take a look at how we can set the bit rate real quick. So it's a matter of dragging a slider or typing a number. So right now our bit rate is set to, this isn't megabytes, it's megabits. So it's set to 8. So it is 271 megabytes. And that is based on a guess of how long the video is. This is a five and <laughs> almost a six minute video. So I'm breaking my own rule, but it's really interesting. Um, so it's taking the length of the video, the size. I don't even actually think it takes into account the frame size. It just takes into account the length and how many megabits per second. So if we were to increase this, let's say I want a really good quality, I'll make it 10 megabits a second. It's 338 megabytes now. If I go into output, and I lower this, I think it will show me a big difference. In it. Let's just preview that. What I could do is I could export a, um, a sample of uh, this. Let me go to like here. A little quick sample. And I'll set this as the out point. So this will be, uh, let's make it a little longer so it's like a 10 second sample. Okay, so I'm going to set the bit rate to 1 right now. And I'm going to, let's ignore this for a second, I'm just going to put it on the desktop. The thing is, this compresses very quickly. So let's export this real quick. Just take a second. Unless I have motion graphics in here, I can't remember. It does. Ah, look at the move. Just so you can see what's happening, this is why it renders so quickly. These are all processors. So it's really blown out the processors on rendering this. So we're setting this to one megabyte a second. Okay, now let's do one more. Let's zoom out here on the screen. And we'll do 10 megabytes a second. And that's a pretty significant jump, but I just want to use it to illustrate the difference. Same 
Look at Garrett. Okay. Here it goes. Oh, there. Yeah. Throw a cover up there. Is that better? Okay. Get me out of the way. Let me pull up these videos. Okay, so here we have, which one is this? This is a 10 megabit, so let's pull up the one. And watch. Looking for is things like this. Look at Thor's face here. See how compressed he's looking. Right here, I'm going to Felicia, Erica, the compression. You can see compression all in here. By compression, I mean little blocks. And okay, so there's that one. Let's take a look at the 10 megabit. Immediately, you see a big difference. See how much clearer this is right Again, see the difference with her face? Pull up the... Okay, so let's compare. So you see the difference? The words are nice and sharp. They're all fuzzy here. Trevor still kind of looks goofy, but not as goofy on this one. So that's the difference between compression is the clarity. But what you, sac what you gain in clarity, you're also going to sacrifice in size. And if you have a smaller file size, you're going to have to lower it, but you're going to have to have less compression. Uh, so, or more compression. And, uh, but if you're dealing with like a 30 second video, you can do a, uh, a decent amount of, um, you know, uh, you can increase the, comp uh, the megabytes, megabits per second, and it will, you know, not be so big because it's smaller. But if you're doing a 10 minute video, imagine how big it would be if it was 10 megabits a second. It'd be, you know, five, 700 megabytes. So those are th some things to consider when you video for the web. So now that we've looked a little bit, and we'll get to questions in a minute, but um, <laughs> now that we've looked at different ways to compress and different ways to um, look at how to set up your video for compression, let's look at the different ways you can share. This is after you've compressed your video, you've done some editing, and at the end of all this I'm going to show you how to tie it all in together and do a little bit of editing and things of that nature. So. Um, different ways to share your video on the web. YouTube. Everybody knows about YouTube. Let's talk about the pros of YouTube. And it is the first on my list because um, I'm missing I'm missing some points. I'm missing some points. I'm sorry. Uh, let me just put these in here. Yes. Ta-da! Instant presentation. Okay, very good. And the rest of the thing won't show up, but that's okay. So, uh, the benefits of YouTube, it is an enormous audience. Uh, it is the number, I think, three, or it's in, the, it's in the top five most visited websites every day in the world. Um, you will reach an enormous amount of people if you're able to hit that special whatever it is to get your video noticed. Uh, time limit, 15 minutes. You can upload a video that's 15 minutes long. Size limit, it's very large. You can upload an over 2 gigabyte file with the advanced uploader tool. It uses JavaScript, it opens up a new window. If you have a file for some reason that's 2 gigabytes plus, use a advanced uploader tool and you can upload it. They've got a really cool help channel that will give you um, uh, some ideas about creating great thumbnails for um, uh, searching and how to have a content ID and uh, tips and tricks and things of that nature. So their, their help file 
is our video is is very good. Um, so that's a big plus for using YouTube. All this stuff. And uh, you need to create an account. You need to um, let's take a look at Christine said from an SEO perspective. Because I know that um, Marlene, you you talked about. Uh, let's see here, Christine, are you able to talk? I like to talk for a second <laughs> about SEO. Do you have uh, do you have a headset or are you called? Are you dialed into the the phone number? Because this is very important to uh, to grasp is the power of optimizing your videos. Yes, no, maybe so. Can I mute you? Are you there, Christine? I don't think she's. Well, let me know if you dial in, and um, uh, if you get a chance to, you can talk about uh, SEO a little bit. But she's right. You're able to um, optimize your video using titles. Um, uh, oh, on the microphone, there's a little button. I think I think you press it, and it will allow you to talk. Um, you can upload uh, and adjust your titles, descriptions, tags, categories. Um, and the cool thing is that she made a note here is that you can um, transcribe, which uh, Jenny just uh, pointed to our very helpful video about our help file about transcribing. This is why transcribing is important, and this is something that's very prevalent on my mind right now. The thing about search and SEO, and here's what's happening. And Brad posted something about statistics. Video is the way the web's going. Video is going to drive a lot of the way we use the web. Um, it's going to get more interactive. It's going to interact more with our data. Um, it's going to be a lot more accessible. I can already, already on my iPhone pull up, you know, videos on YouTube or a lot of videos that are embedded on websites. Not Flash, but a lot of other kinds of videos. You can live stream video. You can pull it up on your iPad. It's everywhere. The thing is, though, search engines can't understand video by and large. The only way they can understand it is if you include good titles, good descriptions, and like we talked about here, transcribing the audio. Because if a search engine goes to a video, it's not able to very accurately transcribe what it is that the person's talking about and pull up good information. There's, in fact, there's a video on YouTube about um, a guy who uploaded a video and then had it auto transcribe, and then he read back what it transcribed, and he did that three or four times, and it turned into a complete disaster and turned, in, and turned into the original thing was like, hey, would you like to go to a concert with me to, hey, orange banana operator biscuit. Like, it, it just completely mangled it. So something will happen soon where search will become a lot more powerful for video. But in the meantime, it's important to learn the SEO tools like enabling titling and things of that nature. Let's show you an example of that. And the same rules apply with SEO that they do for, um, uh, I'm going to pull this up because I love this video. If you get a chance, you should watch it. So here's why um, titling and SEO is important. Uh, we've got uh, the company name right in the title. Uh, couch mode, that's cool, I haven't seen that. Um, we have links, which are very important for SEO. Um, we're thrilled to have these rock stars working with us, so we're doing a little bit of our, our company culture here. This is all linking out to things which increase your search results. Um, we're linking out again to another site on our page, Shipple Web Marketing Team. So we're putting Shipple Web Marketing there, which is good for our SEO. Blog.shipple.com. Um, it's important my name is on there because if it's not, I'm very upset. Um, we've got information about a Canon 5D, another link, and uh, we've got tags on here Shipple, 5D, hiring, web marketing, web design, company culture, things of that nature. Another way to check it out. Let's go to YouTube. And let's pull up a video. ABC Charlie Sims, I'm sure they must have some decent work. So you can see in here, uh, they've got a decent amount of uh, description. So it talks about um, uh, Charlie's Angels. It talks about um, where it's filmed. It talks about the actresses. It's in categories. It's um, Tagged. They didn't do a very good job tagging this. They should have put the name of the, the, um, the show and the actresses and things. Uh, yeah, like that. Sorry, got language in there. Uh, another thing, real quick, I want to mention this. Be prepared with your video content to grow a thick skin. If you're planning on going YouTube and you're planning on not disabling your commenting system, 
I can't use a word I want to, but I call it the greater internet jerk theory, where if you take a normal person, I got this is not my own theory, I, I got this from a comic. If you take a normal person, plus anonymity, plus the internet, it turns in, in, into a jerk. Because nobody knows who they are, and they can say whatever they want. Um, if you are on YouTube, you will get trolled. People will post spam. They will uh, say terrible things about you. They will try to get you to respond. It's rough. I mean, it is the, one of the largest sites out there, and there are a lot of people very active on there. It's very competitive. So just be aware that that's something. A way to get around that is something we're about to talk about, which is how to share and embed your video. But just keep that in mind when doing some video. So keep that in mind for YouTube once you upload it. And uh, I can show you the upload dialog, how to um, enter all that information. So you click on Upload. And let me just choose the video here, and it'll give me my options. So once this is uploading, uh, it allows you to select a title. It allows you to type in your description, your tags. You can select a category. Um, you can make it public. You can unlist it. And only people with a link can view it. You can make it private, so only specific people can view it. Um, you can make it, uh, you know, use the standard YouTube license. Um, use your grant from the YouTube license. Uh, you probably want to do Creative Commons. We're big about Creative Commons here at Shipple. A lot of people use your stuff, you know? Um, so this is all the um, different stuff you can you can type in while you are uh, waiting for it to upload uh, is get a good title, get a good description. Think about SEO the same way that you're going to do that. And I'm going to make this private because I don't really want that on there. So those are some things to keep in mind for that. Okay, so let's take a look at Vimeo. Vimeo is a lot like YouTube. Uh, Vimeo has a lot of um, pluses. Sign into mine. The password is let's do webinar. So the difference with Vimeo is it has a much smaller um, niche. I think of Vimeo is is very much a niche kind of a market. Um, it has videos that are posted by people who are professionals a lot of times. It's a lot more artsy, as you can kind of see here. Um, it hasn't been infiltrated by cats. I guess you'd call it the lolcat cat kind of a thing. Um, but uh, it allows you to have a lot of, I am not a uh, premium member, but it allows you to have a lot more control. And I'll show you that control real quick. So under the settings here, you can choose uh, really good description, really good tagging again, but it allows you to have even more control. Under the plus, under the premium account, the plus account, you can select uh, that you would like it to only embed on your website or these three websites, or um, you can customize your um, your player so that you can do your branding on it, um, so that you can have your logo, your colors, things of that nature. Um, you can see you can password protect things. You can only choose people. Uh, you can allow people to download or not download the source video or not or add or not add to other albums. Um, you can add credits, which is kind of cool. Uh, again, the license. You can add to existing groups. You can choose uh, to add photos. So if you had photos from behind the scenes, you can add them in here, which is really cool. You can upload your own thumbnail. Right now, what YouTube lets you do is, um, and there's a video on there recently, but I haven't chosen thumbnails for YouTube in a while. Uh, but this allows you to make your own thumbnail. And you can see that here that I showed you earlier with uh, the Shipple Vimeo on this video right here. Right. Yeah. This one, the monster video. Uh, our creative director, David Stagg, created this, and we uploaded it as the default video uh, thumbnail. So that's kind of a powerful feature. So you can say, join us this weekend, or join us tonight for the ShippleCon bash at St. Arnold's in it, wink, wink. or join us at ShippleCon. So uh, you can have this as a custom thumbnail. And the list goes on and on uh, for the different things that you can do. So Vimeo is very powerful, but it's a lot more limited as far as the reach goes for who you want to have it uh, shared with. Uh, I forgot to put in here, I had it, I'm sorry, I missed it. The way to get around getting away from the trolls and everything on YouTube is to embed the video on your website. Part of the reason I didn't put it in there as well was uh, it's very in-depth. Um, but what you need to know is that when you're at a place like YouTube, 
or even better, you know, it's over here, is this embed information. And what happens is on most websites, uh, you can click that and we'll pull up a piece of code. In this case, it's this. And you copy this and you paste it into your website and it will put this onto your website. And you can, you know, change your colors and add different information, which totally covers your face. Um, you can autoplay it, loop it, do those things. This is what it looks like in YouTube. And they make it as easy as they can for you to, uh, to embed it. So for here, YouTube selects share. And in this case, the first thing it gives you the option for is just a link to it. And you have different options. I wanted to start at you know, five minutes. Uh, and then you can embed it. So you click embed and it pulls up that information again where there's an iframe. Uh, and one person asked specifically about this. What if I don't want to have the uh, videos at the end that say, you know, let's say we're a nonprofit and we don't want more videos about other nonprofits coming up. So you can uncheck show suggested videos at the end. Um, you can have uh, privacy enhanced mode. You can make it a much bigger embed so that when you put it on your website, it's a nice big video or it's a smaller video or a custom size. You can share it on Facebook, Twitter, and of course, Google Plus One. There are more options. Click right here. So that's how you share your video is by usually on some button on the page, there is a share button. That allows you to do a link or to grab the embed code with some of the options. And what you want to do with this embed code is copy it, open up your website, find where you want to put it, and paste it in there. And that's part of the reason that I didn't uh, put that on the slide is because it's different for WordPress, it's different for Tendency, which is ours, uh, it's different for a custom web page, it's different for Drupal, it's different for a lot of different content management systems or websites out there. But that's where you want to go to get the content you need to put it on your website. So that's one way to share it. And the benefit behind that is it's directly on your site. Uh, you can control comments. You can wrap in whatever beautiful uh, website that you have. You can have it do different things. So it lets you take the code and basically drop the video in wherever you want it. It's a very powerful way of doing it. The other way is just copying and pasting it as links to Facebook and Twitter and things of that nature. So once you've uploaded your video and it's processed, go ahead and grab the embed code and put it wherever you want it. And that's the easiest way and the best way to share video on your website. Okay, here's a couple of resources I'd like you to look at before we get to, and we're wrapping up here, so we're pretty much on time for a little demonstration at the end. And thanks for sticking with me, guys. I know it's a lot of information, but doing a good job of hanging in there. So, these are a number of websites that are um, good to know. And um, the first one is MediaCollege.com, which is a site that I sent you to earlier that talks about a lot of free resources. And the second one, and this is a really great site, it's called VideoCopilot.net. Andrew Kramer here is the guy who runs it. If you want to learn After Effects, go to videocopilot.net. He has great free tutorials to learn some really cool stuff. The only thing I suggest is once you've learned them, tweak them and make them their own because what will happen a lot of times is like, oh, that's a video copilot tutorial. That was kind of lazy. So you want to uh, take what he has and you want to tweak it to make it your own. But videocopilot.net, he's got a bunch of great software. Please go to him, buy his stuff. He's a great guy. I'm a big fan. Uh, tapeworktexas.com. Uh, this is uh, Brad, this is where Brad works. The reason I mentioned Tapeworks is because if you're here in Houston and you're looking to buy video production equipment, cameras, tape stock, uh, memory, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff, check out Tapeworks, call Brad, he can hook you up, he's got great customer service, and people always ask me, where do I, where should I go? I always tell them, check B&H, and then find somebody who'll sell it cheaper, because B&H usually marks it up. But Tapeworks is a great place to go to. MBH Photo Video is right below, the, below that. And then the um, other thing is uh, shipple.com forward slash events. You want to find more webinars, see what we're doing here at Shipple, um, find out about ShippleCon, 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 or any other things that we have coming up. Uh, check out shipple.com forward slash events to pull up more events that we are working on. So at this time, I'm going to open it up to questions for a few minutes, and then I'm going to show you a little bit of video editing and some basics for video editing that you can take to your other applications. Do we have any questions? Hi, Marley.
uh, the best way are you saying that the you shot a video and he wants the video oh. no sure uh, what I would suggest is this filemail.com filemail.com is a free site uh, yeah I, I put it in the chat window there um, it's a free site it allows you to send large files to people and you just type in their email address your email address in fact pull it up here real quick this is a, a good question a lot of people ask how do I send my large video files to other people filemail.com uh, is a really great site let me wait for it to load here okay so you just type your two address so it's going to go to me and it's going to go from my name is awesome.com and then like hi Brian here's your video you are a great speaker and also sending you one million dollars okay so once you've done that you select browse for files and then you file. Mm -hmm. now here's a here's a neat thing and this is very important to um, to keep in mind uh, under advanced you can check notify me when files are downloaded this is very cool because if you have something that's time sensitive and let's say you sent it to somebody and they're like you know well you didn't send it in time or I, I didn't download it till later we could say well I have the confirmation here that says that somebody downloaded it and you're the only person I sent the link to so it, it's not just for like accusatory stuff but it lets you know that the person who sent it to you was able to get it uh, so notify me when files are downloaded is a very very cool thing and it's not automatically selected so you want to select advanced to do this and I think that uh, FireMail allows you to send is it 2 gigabytes for the free version I don't know but I've never run into something for the free version that um, was not I couldn't I couldn't handle so FileMail.com is a uh, yeah 2 gigabytes I mean that's I mean this this website sends it to you I mean 2 gigs for free and it's available for 3 days and I mean this is a great site I have a, a premium account um, because I send files and I need some features but it's a really really great site so that's a good way to send a video file or any other file you need that's large to somebody who's looking for it does that answer your question? okay I do what I can uh, anybody else have any other questions that I can answer to them before I do about five minutes of an overview of Adobe Premiere Anybody? Okay. So I'm going to mute you guys. If you have any questions, type them in on the right too. So let's take a look at Adobe Premiere. And what I'm going to show you are some basic uh, fundamental functions that you're going to use in pretty much any editing program. Now, I have worked with iMovie a little bit, and I will tell you that it is vastly different than what you're about to look at. Um, iMovie. Do I have iMovie? No. Uh, iMovie is very different with the way it handles it. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's take a look at Premiere for just a minute. You know, let me start a new sequence. I don't want you to worry about this technical stuff, start the sequence and all that stuff. Let me just pull something up so you can show you some ins and outs of all I'm doing is selecting a sequence that matches my footage that I have. So what we have are these different windows. So I want what I want you to do is completely ignore the big picture and let's focus on little stuff. So you can see when I highlight things I'm clicking on different areas. So the first thing we're going to look at is the bin window. And then again, this is going to be a very brief overview. Um, the project window, excuse me, project window is where you hold all of your content. You have bins, which hold files. And you have individual files that live within that. Um, one of the things that I would like to say right before I start anything else is project management. Uh, I call this the hit by a bus principle. If I get hit by a bus on my way into work and I'm in the middle of a project I want anybody to be able to sit down look at my premiere project and say oh well he's got all of his clips and eclipse folder he's got all of his after effects in the after effects folder he's got everything from speaker 1, 2, and 3 in their own folders so if I'm hit by a bus I want somebody to be able to sit down and pick it up um, it works for me and uh, it, it's a very good practice to have let me show you how that looks like on a folder level a little bit later on but think about that if I'm working on this is it labeled well does it make sense? Things of that nature. 
there's uh, these different bins. Uh, these are sequences. Sequence hold clips or pictures or video or audio or all kinds of stuff. Um, that's cool, Brad. Uh, so I want to make something very clear too. When you're working in your software, if I delete a clip, it's going to say, oh no, I won't say this. Uh, if I delete a clip, that does not delete the clip from my hard drive. Uh, if I delete this, it won't delete it from my hard drive just by hitting delete. So you can't damage anything when you're working in your um, in your project in Premiere. All you can do is manipulate stuff. So um, let's take a look at what it looks like to edit some footage. So the first thing you want to do is you've imported some footage and I'm going to open up by double clicking and normally in all software you have what is called a source window and a program window. The source window shows the video that is um, pulled up that you've imported. And this is a video that you're working with. You can do all kinds of stuff with this. You can move and sit in and out points and all that stuff, but it doesn't affect anything on your timeline. And the program window shows what is currently at your, what your marker on your timeline is currently on. So if this video is down here, it would show this frame. The basics of bringing in video and putting on the timeline are you open your video by double clicking, usually. And iMovie, it's different. You have your video and then you have these little sliders and you click them and I don't even want to talk about it because it makes me angry. Um, you set an endpoint, so I like Forrest because he looks real nice right there. And you click here by mark in. And then I scroll a little bit where he talks and he looks away and he's sad. And I click mark out. And then I click and drag that to my timeline. And it's now my timeline. So if I were to press play, So that plays it on the timeline there. Now you notice that what I did is I set the endpoint and out point using the buttons, using my mouse. Um, if I can tell you any one thing that I want you to remember about video editing, it's this. Learn keyboard shortcuts. Learn them quickly, learn them well, have a little sheet on your monitor. The faster you can learn keyboard shortcuts, you will become lightning fast in your editor. You'll be able to in and out and drop and blah, 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 and be able to do all kinds of stuff very quickly. What happens is if you're clicking around to different things to do things, you're losing a lot of time. So if you want to become a fast, efficient editor, learn your keyboard shortcuts. So you set an endpoint and an out point, and you drop it down into the timeline. And let's say we wanted another clip. What normally happens is when you drop it in, it puts it at the end of the clip, so let's put another clip. And it's forced again. Let's say I want somebody else. So there is Trevor. And this is a time lapse. And let's not do this because Eric will get. Okay, so here's a wide shot of a chair spinning. I like this shot. This is Trevor giving me a high five. So I press I for the end point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to press L, which will play it. Press play. And I want to get it just before he looks away. See how his eyes are kind of closed? Use my arrow key and bring it back. So he's looking at us. And press O for out. And then what I want to do is I want to put it into the timeline. So I hit comma for insert, and it drops into the timeline there. And it to Trevor, and it's done. So what I've done is I've brought a clip in, I've set an endpoint and an out point, and I've put it in the timeline, and I've sequenced them one after the other, and I have made a little sequence, and from there you could export it. If you wanted to move it, you could just drag this guy over here, and drag him here, and drag him back, and now they're in a different order. I could click this here, and drag it in, and now the so let me start there. I could click it here and drag it here, and that clip is even shorter now. Uh, there are a lot of other very in-depth tools, but those are the basics that you will find for most editing software. You have a you have a sequence, you have a clip, you set an endpoint, an out point, you put your clip on the timeline, and you do that until you've put your clips in order that you like, and then you export your final project. I know it seems very simple. But that's as fundamental as it gets because that's what's going to translate across multiple pieces of software. Get your clips, organize them, endpoint, outpoint, drop it on the timeline, select your next clip, set an endpoint and outpoint, put that on the next uh, in the next point of the timeline, and go through and drop it in. And let me show you one other thing. So we talked about B-roll. Let's say during this part, let's expand this a little bit so I have a little more footage to work with. Um, we talked about B-roll. 
you can see that there are multiple tracks here on the timeline. So if I want to send Cindy, kind of being the next, And then I can click and drag this, and I'm selecting the video track because I don't want the audio track. I could do both. Uh, and I'm putting it on the second layer of video. And the way Premiere looks is from the top down. So this marker is kind of looking down through the footage. So whatever is on top of the footage below it will get shown. So if I press play, and you'll see right about here, right here, the video will change. So boom, there's Cindy. Let's say, and then it goes back to Trevor, feeding up the stuff guy. Um, so that's what sort of an example, let's say Trevor was speaking during this point, but he said, you know, Cindy's a really nice lady, so we kept to Cindy. I really like Cindy because she's always helpful and she's very friendly. It's back to Trevor and he's talking. And so that's what adding some B-roll on another layer looks like, or another piece of footage, is you can do this multi-level, and you can still manipulate it the same way. You can add a number of video tracks, a number of audio tracks up and down, and it lets you do that. So that's a very basic overview of selecting a clip, bringing it in, and then having it show up on your main sequence. Uh, thank you for your time, and I look forward to meeting you all in person or seeing you again. Mm -hmm.